Um, I want to start with a sutta. It's one of my favorite suttas. And I, I, uh, I wasn't always, I didn't always know about suttas. I started uh, reading them uh, several years ago. I used to just put words in the search engine on access to insights. I found out about it on a retreat and I would just put these words in and then read all the suttas and what the Buddha would say about various things. And, just got very, very, very interested in um, just how this whole thing unfolded for him. And because we mostly talk about Dhamma, just the teachings themselves, and we don't always talk about how this actually unfolded for the Buddha, but it was a it was not an easy thing that he went through. So I want to share one of my favorite stories is um, so right after he awakened, he uh, said that he walked around the tree, thanking the tree that he sat under for seven days. I mean, that's got to be something that you like walk around and around and around and around and around this tree, thanking this tree. And he was so still and in peace. And while he was in this kind of secluded, peaceful state, a thought arose to him, I should teach this. And then he said, this Dhamma that I have attained is deep. It's hard to see hard to realize it's peaceful and refined beyond the scope of conjecture. It's subtle to be experienced by the observant. But this generation delights in attachment, is excited by attachment, enjoys attachment. For a generation a delighting in attachment, excited by attachment, enjoy in attachment, this, that conditionality or dependent co-arising are hard to see. This slate, this state of mind is too hard to see. And all of what I have learned, this unbinding cessation, this passion, craving, the ending of craving, and if I were to teach the Dhamma, and if others would not understand me, that would be tiresome for me, tiresome for me, troublesome for me. So then he says, enough now with all this teaching, what only with difficulty I reached. This Dhamma is not easily realized by those overcome with aversion and passion. What is obtruse, subtle, deep, hard to see, going against the flow, those delighting in passion, cloaked in the mass of darkness, won't see. And so the Buddha reflected and decided, nah, I'm not going to teach. I will go back to my practice. And he just settled back into ease. And I have thought about that moment in his life when you know, when, when you have a really good retreat and your heart is just so easeful, you don't even want to leave the retreat center. You just want to stay there. Let's just stay here. Don't even go out there in that mess of a world. And that's where he was too. It's, it's as if uh, um, people think though that that's where it stops and there's something that happened. So, a deva, a Brahmin, um, so if you don't believe in devas, you could say a spirit of any kind came to the Buddha, and well, the deva realized that the Buddha was thinking about not teaching and freaked out. <laughs> and so he came to the Buddha, and he like 
ask the Buddha to reconsider this idea of not teaching. And instead, um, would he like just open his heart, just lend his eye to look out into the world and see that many people would benefit if he would teach. And so this is what he did after he kind of listened to the Brahmin and he thought about it, say, okay, okay, let me think here, let me look out. And he did. And when he did, he saw, like in his mind's eye, he realized that there were going to be beings with a little dust in their eyes. And those with much dust in their eyes. Those with keen faculties and those with dull faculties. Those with good attributes and those with bad uh, attributes. Those easy to teach and, though, and some that would be hard to teach. Some of them would uh, see disgrace and danger in other worlds. So just as a pawn, he said, of blue or red or white locuses, some locuses born and growing in the water might nourish while immersed in the water without rising up from the water. And some might stand at an even level with the water and while some might rise up above the water. Um, he said he began to see that it was not just going to be only the people that were hard and troublesome and a bother. And so he decided that he would go out and teach. And in fact, he did for 45 years. But in that moment, there's something that I think all of us as practitioners have to know. There is a place for us to go and practice and steady ourselves in retreat and even reach these places of depth and concentration and stillness. And, and, and we practice in an environment here that doesn't look anything like real life. And there's a place for us to come and do this together and practice in this way. But the bigger issue is that we take this, what we know, what we experience, and we take it out into the world. And that's what the Buddha did. It went out into the world with all the difficulties that he was going to ultimately face. And he faced a lot. I mean, a lot of people tried to kill him. And a lot of people were very angry with him, very upset because he was not saying what was traditionally said in the culture at the time. Um, so he wasn't speaking out against the traditional way, but just the way he taught kind of undermined some of the, it's the way we've been talking over the course of the, the retreat, some of our thoughts are like, well, I can't do that. And yet the teachings undermine that attitude, that thought. And so he did go out and uh, begin to teach. <clears throat> In fact, what he decided to do was to go find the five friends that left him when he took that food in. And he decided to start there. <laughs> so he set out. They were like 200 miles away, I think. And he set out to find them. And he uh, left and went to teach. The, there's a joke. There's a, there's, a, there's a sutta where he says that he met. It's considered his first Dhamma talk. He met this farmer that was coming and he was going by, but he must have looked different, not like a regular person. Either his, his countenance or something about him looked different. And this person asked him, who are you? Now he asked him, are you a god? And the Buddha said, no, I'm not a god. He's like, well, are you a man? He goes, no, I'm not a man. He said, well, who are you? What are you? And he said he was awake. He was awake. 
And the guy's like looking at him. And uh, he said something about um, that he had found the path to awakening and liberation. And the guy was just looking at him like, okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're doing good <laughs> walk away <laughs> and it's said that when he said it like that he realized that just telling people he's awake isn't really going to help anyone to understand what that means so by the time he gets to his uh, five friends he understands the practice a little bit more in depth and understands what it is that he tries to say. So uh, I don't know if I told this group or if I told some other group, but when he very first came to them, they didn't, they had, uh, they saw him afar and said, oh, there's Gotama. Don't talk to him. Don't have anything to do with him. We're not talking to him because he's like gone on the deep end. But as soon as he got close to him, they were like, <laughs> what happened to you he's like i found it i found the path i found it and they didn't believe him and he had to convince them that he had found the path and in the course of him convincing them he told them about um he told them about uh um the Four Noble Truths, which we've been talking about, and dependent co-arising. Uh, dependent co-arising uh, is this understanding of these 12 links that link together that form the reason why we have suffering, the reason why we have difficulty. It just forms, and it just happens over and over and over. He told them about that, and he told them about... Um, um, the Four Noble Truths. Hold on one second. I just want to see if I have this sutta. Jeez, I never have my computer here, so I can never, like, look up something. Maybe I can try to, uh, maybe I can just try to remember it instead of looking it up. So at the end, this 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 event, when he was with his friends, uh, doing this first teaching, they call this the turning of the wheel of Dhamma. And mostly when you see Dhamma, you see this wheel. That's the way it used to be. We, we see Buddha images, but in the earlier times, what was representative of Dhamma was this wheel. And it said that Buddha had turned this wheel of uh, Dhamma and there's a sutta that at the very end uh, of this meeting that he has with his friends, um, he tells them about the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, and says that everything that rises ceases. That, in, in, that the three characteristics, basically, all phenomena rise and cease, and that he realized that he didn't have to do anything and things would cease, things would end by their very nature. And he, in that moment, one of his friends, his friend's name, Kandanda, Kandana, Kandana. I think it's Kandana, but it's two ends, so it has one of those weird kind of Kandanya, something like that. He knows. And that moment, there are that that sutta is translated in four different uh by four different people. And I that's what I was gonna look for, but I'm just gonna tell you as much as I can remember. But in one of them it says, just this kind of uh in that moment, Buddha realized that Kadanya no knew. Just kind of like flip it. Then there's another one where he says, do you know, Kandanda? Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? Do you understand what I'm saying? But the one that I really like 
it it seems like mudita to me because it's written as if the Buddha is saying, Katanya knows in this exclamation point. Katanya knows. Exclamation point. He knows. He knows what I'm saying. And he had this understanding that in that moment, his understanding could be given to someone else. And you could understand and carry it to your own enlightenment. And there was this that is the nature of the turning of the wheel of Dhamma. It's not that Buddha put his awakening into Kadanya, but he had the ability, unlike many Buddhas, to actually explain what he did to the point where someone could understand it. And that is what changed the whole understanding. That's why the Buddha... I mean, there are stories about how people would just come, 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 people from different castes, people would come and join his sangha uh, because he had a way of articulating the path, not telling people what to do, but articulating the wisdom. And you could, sitting there, eyes closed, not even necessarily watching him, but you could in your own body understand the wisdom. And that's what made him very different than most people. So when he goes and he begins to help his, um, help his uh, friends understand what he was basically telling them was that he had found the middle way because at, at, at the time, there was this kind of belief that you either devoted your time to um, these sensual pleasures and that you could move outside of, of uh, dukkha, difficulty in life, by sensual pleasures. And then there was a belief that you had to go to the opposite. So the sensual pleasures were the people that were in deep concentration, jhana practice, or there was this opposite view of people who practiced uh, in this aesthetic world that I told you earlier. He tried both of these and neither one of them worked, but he found a middle way that produced vision and knowledge. And that it leads to calm, direct knowledge, to self-awakening, and to liberation. And he named this middle way the Eightfold Path, which is what the fourth um, noble truth is. So he, to get to this understanding, he had to investigate dukkha himself. All the dukkha that we talk about all the things that we talk about in relation to practice, he had to practice with all of this. And anything that you can think of, you can put a word in the search engine and you can find his thoughts on it. So it's not anything that we're doing that's so new and so different, even though we are living and talking about his works 2,700 years from when he lived, still same difficulties we have, same difficulties he had. So he had to both actually experience dukkha, he had to understand it, and he had to know that he understood it and had this realization that he understood it. So he didn't just, um, it wasn't theoretical, it was an actual understanding. He had to, when he understood this difficulty that he was having, he could begin to see, just like we can begin to see, this is about me. This is about my own kind of way of being with an experience. Then he had to learn how, he had to basically see himself grasping, and he had to learn how to unhook himself from that grasping. So even though theoretically 
when we come to this retreat, I'm giving morning instructions, Dhamma talks, doing all this expounding about the Buddha's life and what he taught and what his teachings were. In truth, when you are sitting in your meditation, in a moment of clinging, you are like the Buddha himself. Because in that moment, you have to come to some understanding of how to let this go. You can't just say, let me remember what the Buddha did and then boom, that's it. It doesn't work like that. You have to do the same thing he did, which is come to an understanding of how to let this go, how to free yourself from it. And so you have to both experience the craving and the clinging itself and you have to know that I need to let this go. And then you have to know that you have let it go. And that process, regardless of who you are, what kind of practitioner you are, what lineage you belong to, we all have to do that. We all have to come to the knowing of dukkha, to the knowing that this dukkha should be understood and the knowing that we understand it. We have to come to the understanding of seeing our clinging, which is giving rise to that dukkha, that knowing that clinging needs to be let go of and knowing that we have let go of it. Every single practitioner has to come to that on their own. And every single practitioner that actually begins to let go of that clinging in that moment where you feel tight, you feel stuck, and you feel like this is it and this is only it. And you can feel that it's difficult, but you don't know how, and I just don't even know how to let it go. Any one of us that goes through that process, you begin to feel the freedom that comes from letting that clinging go. You feel it. It's not something that intellectually you understand, but you feel that release that comes when you actually let go of clinging. And he realized that that cessation, that's what he called cessation, the remainderless, that cessation had to be realized by any practitioner and that you have to know that cessation is to be realized and you have to know that you just realized a moment of cessation and every time you realize that's what cessation is i do, i it's gone it's free that realization is what leads you to stay on the path and go further into this path so when I told you about sitting at the bus stop, I did not know any dukkha. I didn't know difficulty and, and the dukkha, the struggling. I didn't know my own craving. And I didn't realize that at the bus stop, I had let go of that. It is the nature of what happens to us, but I didn't have any clue of what was happening. And now, years later, I know I understand, I see when I have let go of some mental uh, entanglement that's uh, driving me, I could see. So finally, he saw this path that uh, could be cultivated in order for this to happen. So when I first used to read the Four Noble Truths, I thought the order was wrong, right? I could see there's dukkha, and then there's the cause of dukkha, and then it should be the path leading to the end of dukkha, and then the cessation of dukkha. That's what I thought the order should be. And it never made any sense to me that um, the path was at the end. But tonight, I want to talk about why I believe the path at the end is the right place for it to be. Because once you have a moment of cessation, once you begin to 
I don't mean a moment of cessation as in you are awake. I mean, in your sit, you are grappling with something and then all of a sudden you let it go and you feel that ease when you let it go. That moment right there, you're like, oh yeah, this is the path. That right there inspires you to come back and sit again to come back and sit again, to deal with all of this difficulty over and over and over. So that cessation keeps you on the path. And the path is what we're going to talk about here in just a moment. That path, when we talk about it, I think it cultivates your ability to see more dukkha. And then you see dukkha, and then you see how you're clinging and craving and you gradually let that go and you feel that ease and you're like, yeah, okay, I'm doing the right thing. Get you back on the path. What does the path show you? More dukkha. <laughs> you're like, oh yes, okay, more dukkha. I see what I'm doing. I let that go. Got the ease. Okay, on the path, more dukkha. That's all it's doing. This wheel is beginning to turn in your life. And the more you see dukkha, the more you learn how to let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. And the more you let it go, the more you're going to see. The more you see, the more you're going to let it go. And eventually, can you not see how you awaken? Because gradually, this letting go, letting go, letting go, there is this remainderless. There is nothing left to be let go of. And that's what he was pointing to. He said that when he began to see this inevitability of this freeing divine that would happen through this path, that a vision arose, insight arose, discernment arose, knowledge arose, illumination is what he called it, arose within me with regards to things never heard before. And then he began to understand so even though these monks were strong practitioners, all five of them were, only one understood what the Buddha was saying. Only one in that moment understood what he was talking about. Because it takes uh, a while to grasp this, what it is that we're doing. It's not something that just comes naturally. Well, because we are a generation delighting in attachment. <laughs> so Sharon says... Sharon Salzberg said, to be truly happy in this world is a revolutionary act. It is a radical change of view that liberates us so that we know who we are most deeply and can acknowledge our enormous ability to love. It's a radical act to be doing this kind of practice because most People in the world, their idea of freedom is fixing everything out there. So I'm going to be righteous. Uh, the world I'm going to live in is the kind of world I want. And that's the world I'm aiming for. The problem with that theory is we could sit in this room and ask every single person, there's only 16 of us, 17 of us. We could ask every single one of us, what's the world you want to live in? It will not sound the same. And so every one of us are trying to create the outer world like we want. And you can imagine we are bumping up into each other. We are getting on each other's nerves, thinking, well, why, why isn't this world coming out the way I want it to be? And whoever has the most push, they push theirs. And then I've lived a long time. I've noticed that whoever gets the upswing, like at a game, whoever's got the wind at their backs, they start winning, 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 winning. And then some turbulent thing happens, something happens on the other side. They start winning, 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 winning. So all we are doing is pushing up against the world, pushing other people into ways we want. And this has been going on since we have been on this earth. Buddha did not do that. He's like, I'm not even looking out there. I'm looking in here. 
So when we start cultivating these eight factors for the Eightfold Path, we are not trying to cultivate something out there. We are trying to cultivate something inward. So the word, the other thing about Buddha is the way he uses words. Like Nibbana, Nibbana is a very weird word because it, it was an ordinary word. I just didn't realize how ordinary it was. This idea, Nibbana, cooling of things, such an ordinary word that he would use as the cooling of the fires of passion within us. So we say that word in English and we've made it into some Nibbana. But at the time Buddha used it, it was just Nibbana, cooling off, settle it down. Simple as that, simple words. Same way with this word he used that we have translated into right. So each of the factors, uh, each of the eight factors in the Eightfold Path has the word right in front of them. So there are eight factors. There is divided into three parts. First part, wisdom, view, and intention. And right before each word, he puts the word right. Right view, right intention. Second part, conduct ethical conduct, right action, right livelihood, or right action, right speech, right livelihood. Third part, your meditation, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. And that's his path. That's, this is what you're working in, this little box. But here is the thing about the way the Buddha did it. The word he used was sama. Sama. That's that's what uh, the word he used in front of each, and we translate that in English to right. But uh, Ajahn Pasano said that that's not a true translation of what that word is. The true translation of what its, its word is, it's used in musical, it's, it's, it's a musical word. So it means attuned, right? You're tuned, you're harmonized. So it would be like, imagine if the Dhamma was like a bell in a pitch, like a tuning fork, and it's, that's what it's doing. It's tuning you every time as you go along. It keeps tapping you, it keeps hitting you and you get this resonance that tells you something's not right. You can tell when I got paper in there. <laughs> it's not quite right. It doesn't quite sound right. But then you can hear it like that. It's like, oh, that's in tune. That's in tune. That is what I think the Dhamma, this is what I think the Buddha's Eightfold Path is designed to do. It's designed to get us in tune, harmonized with the moment. And the way that we know we're out of harmony is harm because we feel it. We feel something's not quite right here. Something's out of tune and we don't have that harmonic kind of resonance in relation with it. So let's think about this path a different way then, because even though we call it a path, it sounds like we're going on some kind of a journey. When we think of path, we think of walking, but this path is not about conduct, not conduct per se. <clears throat> it's about um, potentiality. It's about energy. It's about the possibility. So when you think about tuning, you're trying to tune your kind of, you can think of bodily movements in tune with the way you feel on the inside, the way we're doing the Qigong. This is part of why that Qigong 
putting it with Dhamma came so alive for me because it's like I was beginning to move the body in relation to this attunement with Dhamma. So you're not acting, you are moving. It's like movement, uh, walking meditation is, is not uh, walking, it's movement. You are just moving when you go to work, when you go to the store, when you go to your mom's house, when you go to your friend's house, you're moving and you're moving in attunement harmonic, harmonically with the first three, knowing dukkha, knowing the cause of dukkha is your own craving and the releasing of that craving and the cessation of that. And you're moving in attunement with those three understandings. So this uh, first, so if we look at this as not conduct, then what we're looking at is how we're perceiving the world. A lot of times when we feel dukkha, if we go to our view, we're beginning to see, I'm holding on to a view. I'm holding on to a thought that this is the way it should be. If we go to our intentions, we may have this kind of, I don't really want to hurt nobody, but I really want you to give me that. I really want you to do it my way. And so that our intentions are based out of greed and aversion, and it's not based out of kindness and care. So even though we don't want to hurt anybody, and even though we might want to have this, have my way, this is, I'm just going to use me. This is one of the first things I realized is that most of my harm came from wanting to have things done my way. I could not, I could not see, <laughs> this is going to sound terrible. I could not see how anybody else's way was right. <laughs> I could not, Stacy, understand? <laughs> It's just wrong. I did it all lined up. I knew exactly what to do. Let's do it my way. Everybody's going to be happy. What is the problem? I had such a hard time that the way I released myself from this, I could feel all this tension all the time, all the time. And so the way that I began to move into the second and third noble truth is I begin to understand I was clinging to my way, my way, my way. And so the way I released it was I generously gave people the opportunity to have their way sometimes. <laughs> you can have your way. You can have your way. This generous act that I would do out of kindness. I don't think my family, kids, and anybody thought it was an act of kindness. It's like, finally, <laughs> letting somebody else have an opinion. But for me, it was the only way to let go of that that clinging to my view that I was right. Mm -hmm. And the more I let my way go and let other people have their way, the more I could see I'm not always right. Mm -hmm. I'm not, just because I feel and think I'm right, it doesn't mean that I am right. And the more I could see that. Before, wasn't gonna be able to see this. So the harm, the, this harmonic resonance that we're trying to come into is not about trying to make us be a certain kind of person. It's more about learning to be sensitive to where there is harm, where there is tension, where something is tight and constricted and consider shifting your view. It starts with view and perception. And that when you begin to shift your view and perception, it affects your actions, your movement, your speech, the way you work. And this meditative process 
helps us begin to feel into the sensitivity of our view. You see how this is all kind of working together. So we are going inward. This is where we're going. We're not going outward. So this journey on this path is more and more and more going inward. We're going in, 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 in. And it took a while for me to learn I'm such an extrovert. So extroverts, we tend to obsess over out there. And introverts, it seems like they're inside, but mm -mm, they are inside talking about what's going on <laughs> out there. It's all in here, but it's about out there. And more and more and more, I begin to realize that this had nothing to do with out there. I can be in a world out there if I am more and more and more centered in here, that it didn't matter what was going on out there if I was centered. And I, the, the practice itself was such a different thing for me because when you grow up in trauma, and I'm sorry if I like blurted out something so like raw this morning. <laughs> I didn't realize what I was saying until after I was doing the talk and I was like, oh, I probably shouldn't have said that about my dad. That was probably a little bit too much information. But the that's what I spent my life dealing with. When you grow up in trauma, you spend your life trying to make right some wrong that was done to you. And oh my God, I spent a of gobs of money, went through all kinds of training. I mean, the worst. I don't know if you guys know about the forum. Has anybody here ever done the forum or heard about it? Oh my God, I went to the forum. They locked the doors. They stress you out. I cannot believe the misery I am putting myself through to somehow free myself from this. I went from one person to another. Um, Tracy Chapman has a perfect song that goes with this. It's called um, uh, Who Took Away who stole your heart? That's what it is. Who stole your heart? Mm -hmm. Who took away the part of you that's inside you that belonged to you? Who did that? This robber, this thief, mm -hmm. and that you've gone to wizards and witches and magic people trying their best to fix all this. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what I did. I spent my life, a, a good 40 <laughs> years, trying to find my way away from the stress of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And none of it, I mean, it was all good stuff. I learned all this theoretical stuff, but none of it unhooked me from the strain of my life. Why? Because I still carried this view that I was right. I was right. This is the way to do it. Everybody, what I was trying to learn was how do I use appropriate language to get you to mm -hmm. do what I want? And that's all it was about ever was be nice, mm -hmm. kinder, don't be so rough with people, be easy. And then people will gladly <laughs> give <laughs> well one they didn't know no black folks we, I don't care how nice you are we ain't going for it I said I'm not going for that I'm not going for it <laughs> so this idea that I could somehow improve myself good enough to be able to influence out there it, it doesn't work and when I finally stumbled upon, upon the Dhamma, the way I stumbled upon it is I had failed. I got this notice 
that I had failed the bar for the second time time. I had depended. I'm just going to go to law school. I'm smart. I'm going to get out of law school, make a lot of money, be a millionaire, and then I can set my life the way I want it to be. Well, it starts with passing the bar. <laughs> I failed it the first time, and I just assumed it was a racist exam and all Black people fail. So I'm going to take it the second time, and that's when everybody passes it. I took it the second time, and when I failed it the second time, I thought it was me, something's wrong with me. And this whole balloon, this whole world I had crafted thinking of what was gonna happen came tumbling down. And I went to Barnes and Noble to try to find some book to convince myself how to live in misery and be happy. Cause that's it. It's not gonna, it's not like the world's gonna ever work for me. And so I'm just, if I'm going to live in misery, I'm going to be happy. And I stumbled, <laughs> I stumbled upon Trumbo Rinpoche's book. I stumbled upon his book, um, Mind Training, Cultivating Loving Kindness. And I remember opening that little book and the the book is, the, the mind training, it's a Tibetan practice called Lojan. It's 59 slogans. So it's 59 little pithy statements. And then there's a commentary about what that statement means. And I opened the book. And the statement I opened the book to was, abandon all hope of fruition. Abandon <laughs> all hope of fruition. <laughs> I had, I came from Christianity. I mean, hope is the fundamental <laughs> basis on what we live out of and abandon all hope of fruition. I did not understand how any of that could cultivate loving kindness. That didn't make any sense to me at all. And I remember reading Trump's commentary. He wrote some of the best way of the warrior. He wrote some of the best books ever in Dhamma. And I read this commentary and I had this collapse that there may be some truth to this, that maybe this constant hoping, 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 hoping was part of the problem. And so I took it home and that's what my practice was. I would read a slogan a day with his commentary for 59 days and I would sit quietly for 30 minutes kind of like in my happy place. And then I would start over on day 60 with number one again, 59 days. Day 60, start over again. For 10 years, I did that. That was my practice. And I was cultivating the paramis the whole time, but I didn't know it. I was just cultivating, trying to understand these 59 weird ways of understanding trying to understand how I could move in the world that way. But you can see that what I was doing was course correcting my view, course correcting my view. And then I moved back home to Seattle. I was living in Kansas City at the time. So I moved back home to Seattle. And when I moved back home to Seattle, I uh, started going to Seattle Insight. And I took Rodney's beginning meditation course. And that's the first kind of understanding I had around insight practice. And then the rest is like history. I just stayed there and never stopped going. So this, this path that I started taking was unhooking me from my own, uh, all my, it's, it's like I begin to see that anytime I had any kind of discomfort, grumbling, any kind of negativity, no matter how much I wanted to say, it's because of that, I begin to realize it has something to do with me and my view. And if I, un if I shift my view, let go of the view I have, shift and turn gradually, I would get freer and freer and freer. So the last piece of this 
these this eightfold path that we're moving through is we're not moving. One is it's not conduct. We are trying to create a harmonic resonance with our lives. Two, it's not an outward world fixing the world. We're inwardly fixing ourselves, untangling our own um, kind of craving and clinging. And then third, we're looking for something we have not seen before. We are not looking for some uh, regurgitation or new way of saying old wisdom. We are looking in a moment when you're sitting there at home in your meditation, you are not looking for the, you know, to remember that wisdom thing I heard before. You are looking for in this moment, what can be done in this moment with this tension and this trauma right here, me by myself, no one else is here. And we're looking for what I can do in the moment. There's a newness about it, a freshness about it that uh, is not something, um, it's not that we need to get rid of our thinking mind, but it is beginning to trust the body's kind of harmonic tone because that is gonna help us see something we're not used to. The thinking mind only knows what it only knows. And it never comes up with something new. It just kind of regurgitates what's already been known. But this body is very much in the present moment and it can craft, see, cultivate anything. Anything is possible for it in a present moment. So the idea is to be in the present moment and decide what is to be done in this moment. So the last thing I wanna leave you with is, I'm gonna read a sutta at the end, but the last piece of wisdom I wanna leave you with is um, Buddha's instructions to Rahula. Because Buddha gave these instructions to Rahula when Rahula was seven years old. Uh, and the instructions I'm about to give you, anybody that has any seven-year-old, they don't remember nothing. <laughs> but the Buddha's instructions were long and complicated. He said to Rahula, he asked him, what do you do with a mirror? Before you say anything, before you think anything, and before you do anything. I want you to reflect. Is this thing I'm about to say, about to think, about to do, is this thing going to be harmful? Is it skillful? Will it have a beneficial end or a harmful end? I want you to think that, reflect upon that. Repeatedly, before you speak or act. Then he goes, and then once you've started the act, this thing that I have done, this thing I said, this thing I, um, the thing I said, the thing I thought, the thing I did, was that skillful? Was that harmful? Uh, did, is it gonna lead to a good consequence, a harmful consequence, or, or a beneficial consequence? So then he says to Rahula that um, if he finds that any time during the pre-discussion, during the thinking, or after the act, if at any time you decide this is not skillful, this is not going to lead, this is harmful, and it's not going to lead to a good result, you have to stop. And if you decide that it is, then you can keep going. And I remember reading this thinking, 
there is no way some kid at seven years old is one going to remember this, two even going to do it. I can't even imagine an adult doing this. And so I remember being so irritated at the idea that the Buddha would put that much pressure on a seven-year-old. And then I begin to think about this for, let me think about this for, think about this for a minute. The Buddha said to do this, first of all, repeatedly. So if he says do it repeatedly, then he must assume that Rahula was going to be messing up a lot. So you're going to have to repeatedly do this. He couched repeatedly in it. So it's not like this is the way you need to be. He's saying you repeatedly think about this so that he understands you're not always going to be righteous. This is a training. It's not an edict of how you need to be. Secondly, he tells him to reflect, not this is what you need to do. He just wants you to consider, think about it, take a moment. Is this going to be harmful? Is this going to be okay? Think about it. While you're talking, you start feeling that little, is this okay? Maybe I shouldn't say this. This kind of, and then the last thing that I think is important is he said, after you've done it. How many times do we think we have to get it right the first time? But he said, after you have finished and you look back on it, was that skillful? Was that not skillful? And I begin to realize that really what the Buddha had taught Rahula was how to live without shame, completely because you're doing it all the time. It's a training. You are not trying to get it right. You do it at the beginning. Maybe you catch it at the beginning. Maybe you don't. Maybe you catch it after you've done it and look back on it and say, that wasn't so good. I saw in my relation with my sister, she and I never got along, never. We yelled at each other constantly. And then when I started trying what the Buddha said to Rahula. I never, I would sit in my car before I went in and say, okay, good. no cussing, no <laughs> yelling at nobody. Whatever she said, let her have her way. That's the way we're going to be. It never worked out like that. <laughs> and then I would go home and I would sit down and I would sit on my chair and say, what happened? Who said what? Who did that? Then this happened, that happened, this happened, that happened. I could feel it gradually go home. And, and I don't know about you guys, but in our family, Sunday dinner, every single Sunday. So plenty opportunities mm -hmm. to go back, go through the whole thing again, come home. <laughs> what happened? She said that, I said this. And I started feeling all the tension, reliving all these tense moments in that house, sitting there at home in my chair, reliving it. And then one day I went to her house. She said something. I felt this kind of tension, but I didn't do anything. And everybody kind of looked at me like, <laughs> what you going to say? I said, oh, it's okay, Deborah is right, you know. They were like, what? You gonna <laughs> let her just say that? I'm like, it's okay. It's no big deal. Even Deborah, I could feel something I had never felt before. That family of all of our siblings begging me to lose it. Because if I lost it and I got angry, everybody else is okay. Because I'm not like her. I'm not like Dwayne. She's all angry, but I'm not. And I realized in that moment, they had to hold their own anger. And I used to be the carrier of all the anger because I was the most big, loud, crazy person. I carried everybody's anger. No, everybody else looked good. And I didn't do it. 
it was much, I could, I could sit there and feel myself saying, I should just say a few things, just to tone the energy down in here because it was so difficult not to carry their anger. But no matter what my sister said, I didn't budge. I didn't feel it. It's not, I don't want to give you the impression that she was the one instigating all the time. I did my own share of instigating. But in this moment, what all that practice of going home and sitting with it, I knew that feeling. I knew what it felt like to be angry. And I no longer had to be pushed by the impulse of it because I knew what it felt like. I was just irritated. It's not a big deal. I sat at home with it all the time. And I understood what the Buddha was saying. That if we get, if we are willing to repeatedly reflect upon this conduct, action, what we're going to say, even if we can think before we say it, if we don't think before we say it, do it, think it, and we start doing it, if we could reflect then in the midst of it. Maybe we can, maybe we don't. Okay, we do it. We've already said it, done it. We've already thought it. Then reflect afterwards because there's always opportunity to reflect off afterwards. And he held afterwards, same as doing it before you did it. Same as doing it when you did it. Doesn't matter. So this practice on the path it became this training wheels that I started turning, 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 turning. And gradually, I was uh, completely free of all these habit energies that I always did all the time, thinking I'll never get rid of it. So anyway, I've gone over. I want to leave you with this last little thing he said. This is, I think this is so beautiful. He was trying to describe to his friends what he thinks he did, um, what he thinks, how he wanted to describe what he thought of what he was doing. Um, this is after he had been teaching for a while and it was nearing the time of his death. He said, it's just as if, a, I'm gonna change the pronouns. Uh, it's just as if a person Traveling along a wilderness track were to see an ancient path, an ancient road traveled by people of a former time. And they would follow it. And following it, they would see an ancient city, an ancient city, an ancient capital inhabited by people of former times, complete with parks and groves and ponds, walled, delightful. And they would go to address the elders of the city and say, sirs, you know, good people, you should know that while traveling along a wilderness track, I saw this path and I followed it. And I saw this ancient city uh, and uh, please rebuild that city. And so the, the, Elders would rebuild the city so that at a later date, the city would become uh, powerful, rich, and well-populated, fully grown and prosperous. So in the same way, I saw an ancient path, an ancient road traveled by rightly self-awakened ones of former times. And what is that ancient path? that ancient road traveled by the rightly self-awakened ones of former times, just this noble eightfold path. Right view, right aspiration, intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Uh, and um, this is the ancient path, the ancient, uh, uh, ancient road traveled by the rightly self uh, awakened ones of former times. And following that path, I came into the direct knowledge of the, uh, I came into the direct knowledge of what he says, fabrications, but that's the dukkha. 
direct knowledge of the uh, origins of fabrication, dukkha, direct knowledge of the cessation of fabrications, dukkha, and direct knowledge of the path leading to the cessation of fabrications, dukkha. And knowing that directly, I have revealed that to monks, nuns, male lay followers and female lay followers and all kinds of practitioners here um, uh, so that this holy life has become powerful, rich, detailed, well populated, widespread and proclaimed among celestial and human beings. Isn't that special? Such a beautiful thing. That's what we're doing here. He just found some path. He didn't make up something. He found this direct path that was already in existence, but it had been grown over and we've forgotten it. And then he just brought it back into existence for all beings. So let's sit for a moment here quietly. Thank mm -hmm. you.